Good evening. I'm Matt from Three Skulls Tavern, and I'm doing another Pitchfork Dev Diary. Um, this one is a little bit different to the previous ones. Hey there, Mediocre Dad. Um, in that I'm basically nearly ready for playtesting. Um, hey, Attila, Lassa, hey. Um, yeah. <laughs> I've actually shared a plate, a link to this playtest document um, over on my Discord server, so people have had a quick look at it a few hours before the stream started. Um, those are the, the people who have, um, yeah, interact with me regularly over on Discord. Um, but I'm going to share it here as well, the link to it in the chat, so that people watching can can find the link um, and look at it live, comment directly on it live while I'm working on it, and then also after the stream is finished. Um, you can go in and have a look. So this is kind of like a soft release of the of this playtest. I'm calling it a soft release because it's not quite there where I want it to be to be releasing it widely as, look, this is my playtest document. I want as many people as possible to go out and try and play it. This is really just an early sneak peek at it. And for the people who have been following my dev diaries, that's basically what I want to do. I want to kind of give you a, a sneak peek at it. So I'm going to share the, the link over in the chat. So give me just one second while I look that up and type it in. And then we'll get cracking. All right, here we go. Okay, there's a link. So there have been a lot of changes to Pitchfork. Um, again, I can never remember exactly. <laughs> I'm working on this in between dev diaries. Um, otherwise, there's just there's just too much to get done. But I've I've been doing a lot of scrubbing. Um, I've done a few changes to what I'd done in the last session. Last session, I, I spent a lot of time on character sheets, and um, I changed a few things like the names of characteristics, for example, um, which I can kind of show right now. So I've I've moved. I've gone away from toughness and willpower as the secondary characteristics, and I've gone back to vitality and stability. Because in my head, toughness is a little bit too much like constitution. In vitality, I want it to be a little bit more um, all-encompassing and, yeah, a little bit more kind of broader. And vitality is health, as well as your stamina, your endurance, everything like that. Um, so for me, it's a slightly broader term, which I like the sound of better. And likewise, willpower is one aspect of what I consider stability, but stability is kind of also your your intuition, as I've, as I've written here, your determination, that sort of thing. So uh, stability, to me, encompasses a little bit more than willpower, but willpower falls under it. Um, I also like the terminology there, that they both end in I-T-Y, stability and vitality. So they kind of, that kind of ties them together a little bit, which I liked. Um, so yeah, and then I'm also trying to keep an, um, this is something that I just I just tend to do, but there's so many different words you can use for characteristics and attributes, that sort of thing, that really you can kind of pick and choose and and try and play around with the try and play around with the uh, semantics a bit. So when looking at the secondary, well, so one of the things I want to do is with all of these characteristics is I want to make sure that they all start with a different letter, just because when you um, see them written down, um, it can be a little bit confusing when some of them are are similar. And stability, for example, starts with an ST. And I had strength before. That also starts with an ST. And just to remove conf remove, uh, remove confusion, because I do want to try and compress some of these um, characteristics into stat lines and use simplified like abbreviations, I didn't want to have stability and strength because they're too close to each other. Um, so I wanted stability and not willpower. So it was a case of looking at strength and renaming it to something else. Um, physique is a term, I believe it's used in Vazen. I'm just going to check that very quickly. But I believe that's a, that's a term that has been used in, um, yeah, it's the strength stat in Vazen. So it kind of is a nice little tie to an existing Year Zero game. And so I went with that. Um, that presented another problem because um, dexterity, as, as you see here, was previously called precision, and then it would have... I'd have physique and precision, again, two P words. Um, so to get around that, I just went back to a, a, a word I had kind of wanted to use anyway, which was dexterity. 
mainly because if you look at three letter acronyms are not three uh, three letter um, abbreviations dex is something that everybody understands there's a slight downside to it in that a lot of D, &D players especially will consider dex to be um stealth which it isn't agility is also not stealth stealth is very much um under the under the umbrella of cunning um although yeah sleight of hand types of things like if you're doing um sneaky things like uh palming an object or picking a pocket or something like that that would definitely fall under dexterity but yeah the other the other positive thing with having agility and dexterity is that warhammer um sorry wolfrup fourth edition has agility and dexterity exactly as i'm pitching them here which is agility is your speed your nimbleness that sort of thing and dexterity is your hand um your your eye to hand coordination uh, your precision that sort of thing um, so I'm, that also ties it a little bit to Wolfrip, which I which I quite like. Also, fellowship being the um, the kind of social stat also ties it to Wolfrip, which I also like. And now I have a set of eight characteristics, which all have a different letter. I'm very very happy with these. I changed this, I think, like a day or two after my previous um, stream, and I haven't touched it since. I've been very very happy with it. So that's a big change. Um, <sighs> Another big thing I've changed, skills. <laughs> um, I did originally was thinking about having skills as just a single a single tag. But it doesn't leave a lot of options open in terms of like if you're if you're highly skilled at something, it, you shouldn't be getting the same bonus as if you are if you had just learned something. And it makes sense in my head to actually have them ranked, but I don't want them ranked one to five. I want them ranked one to three and tying into the whole idea of apprentice, journeyman, master. Although um, I'm going with a Simbaroom naming convention here for novice, adept, master because it's a bit, it's a bit tighter. I like the I like the wording of that a lot. Um, it's one thing I really liked about Simbaroom. So skills now are ranked one to three. Characteristics, as I've put up here at the top, are ranked one to five. So you can automatically see I'm, I've gone away from my original vision, which was just having nothing but skills and no attributes. I then move that to um, just having characteristics with a, with just a tag for the skills. So the skills is just kind of like a little advantage you would, you would possibly get. To now going back to almost default uh, Year Zero Engine, which is attributes plus skills. And both of them having ranks which can add dice. Now I'm diverging from that because skills don't give you five dice like they do in um, in typical like all the other Year Zero games. But still, that's that's something I've kind of come back to. But I actually really like now that I've come kind of full circle and come back home to the uh, the kind of Year Zero way of doing things. It does solve a lot of design issues I'd been kind of wrestling with. So and one of them is around advancement, which I'll also talk around because I put a little bit of thought into that and careers. So yeah, that's a that's a fairly big change, and just to show you what I've done with the um, with the character sheet, I made made some slight changes to the character sheet from last time, just to show um, you know what I'd updated. So I'll just quickly show that as well. So you can see, obviously, the terminology has been updated a little bit. So it's vitality and not um, whoops, it's vitality and not. Um, Toughness and stability instead of willpower. Um, st strength is still there, so I need to change that back to physique. So physique, agility, and dexterity. So those all change. Now, what I had before is I had I had two columns for skills that kind of lined up with this this like line here. Um, and what I've done is I've I've changed that. So it's literally just a single one here, and now there's a checkbox that you can check to show your rank in the skill. So that's just a little small change to the Google one. Um, I'm going to have to think about maybe making some, some bigger changes to the PDF one. But for the purposes of playtesting, when this does get playtested, um, because of Corona, um, I have a feeling that most people are going to be using this character sheet anyway rather than the PDF one. So the PDF one will need to be updated at, a, kind of at another time. Um, I won't be doing that live on stream because that's something that um, might take a little bit of time with fiddling around with, um, with settings and things. And I'll just do that on my own when I've got um, a spare hour or two. So that's a big change there. Um, going back over here, then let's just quickly um, sc uh, scroll down and see what else I've changed. Um, just renamed relationships to bonds. Character advancement. Now I've changed a little bit here. So 
I've effectively said that you can do three things, which I need to update because I did was kind of moving things around. So, there are three things you can do to advance your character. You can increase a skill, you can swap a characteristic, or you can change your career. Um, these are very specific things. So, I wanted to have I wanted to have the ability. So, one thing that I have done is I have the uh, the uh, characteristics. The amount of characteristics you start with are significantly lower. Not significantly. They're lower than what the um, equivalent would be in the year, the normal Year Zero engine games. As a result, um, characters are going to feel a lot less capable when you're looking at their their attributes than you would than they would in any other of the games. And because of that, I want the ability to allow some flexibility with moving characteristics around. And to handle that, I'm going to kind of do the second one first. I'm basically saying you can swap a characteristic point, but it's limited. And the idea is that your career will have a key characteristic listed for it. So if I jump down to careers very quickly. Um, here, so I've, this is also something I've done. Um, artisan has the characteristic dexterity. Boater has the characteristic physique, etc. And these characteristics basically mean that when you ha when you have this career, um, you are able to increase that characteristic by one once while you have that career, up to a maximum of five, which is the maximum you can go up to. And to do that, you have to reduce another attribute by one. So you're basically, you're kind of moving your characteristic points around to allow you to have a higher value um, on these things. So it's a juggling thing. You're not actually getting additional, you're not, you're not getting additional um, characteristic or attribute points. You're just shuffling them around a little bit. And it's very limited. You can only do that once. Um, I'm also probably going to, um, I didn't think about this because I just added that very quickly. Um, I will change that so... Um, you can't do that like as soon as you've taken on the new career. You have to have put some time into advancing some of the other, um, some of the skills tied to that career first. Um, and I'll have to think, have a little think about how I'm going to do that. So, in fact, I'll do that right now while, while it's fresh in my mind. Um, the other thing as well is you can't do this with your starting career because every career has a has an attribute assigned to it. And I've got it so that at character creation, you get a plus one to that characteristic as like a as like a bonus. So because you start with that, because the idea is you've had this career for a while. This is this is when the game starts. You you are you are in that career. You've got all the skills associated with it. You've got the characteristic bonus associated with it. So you don't get an additional um, characteristic bonus as well. You just get to you've you've already taken it kind of. So this is after. Like, this is only applicable from your second career onwards. So the one thing I just want to add in here as well, then, is um, swapping characteristics can only happen once um, a total once at least five ranks have been uh, so once all key skills relating to that, to the career, um, this is the sum, so how do I say that, uh, add up to at least five ranks. Okay. So that's basically saying you have to have invested some skills into this thing. So you're kind of like improving yourself within this um, within this career before you're allowed to take the characteristic swap. It also means if you decide to swap out of the career into a different one before you've spent those before you've got those um, those skill increases, you wouldn't be able to swap the the characteristic around. So like if you change to something else, and that's fine as well. It's like okay, you've you've taken this new career on for a little short length of time. You haven't been at it long enough that it's Im improved your kind of your raw physicality or like your your raw abilities in terms of your characteristics. 
because you've moved on to do something else. And that's I think that works quite well. Um, the five ranks, I mean, this is this is a number I've just literally pulled out of my arse. Um, there are three skills associated, so maybe I'm going to change it to six. Um, there are three skills associated with every career now instead of four. Um, and that would mean you'd, you would need to put at least two. Um, you'd need to be an adept level in all three of them for you to be able to get that increase. Or you could be a master in one, um, a master in two, and completely, you know, untrained in the third. Or you could be a master in one, you know, three in one, two in another, and one in, in one in the third. However you want to look at it. But the idea is here, you need to have at least six ranks invested. Maybe, um, might be five, might be a bit better. Um, but the idea, I, I don't want people to be swapping characteristics often. It needs to be like a fairly serious thing after you've invested a lot of time in, um, in that career. Hey, Groldfar. So... That's swapping a characteristic. Um, increasing skills. Increasing. There's no experience points in this game, so you're not tracking experience points. The idea is that you can increase a, one of your key skills for your career with practice in during downtime between adventures. And I'm going to have to add some... I'm, I put this in here. Use the advancement section of your character sheet. So I'm going to put a little plus here and say um, need to add advancement tracking. To character sheets. The idea is that you'll have a little section at the bottom of your character sheet or somewhere on your character sheet that'll say advancement and you write in a skill that you're working on and there'll be like a, just a little tracker with some boxes next to it and every time that you spend a period of downtime um, practicing that skill you put a little cross in it and once you have as it says here once you've progressed your your key skills, like a number of a number of downtime periods equal to the new rank of the skill, you get to take that skill. Um, so if you're at if you're at rank one for one of your key skills, and you spend two periods of downtime, um, which would be kind of like two periods in between when things are adventures are happening. That could be a week, it could be a month, something like that. It should be longer than a day. In fact, I'll probably put that here. Um, usually in downtime between adventures, and I'll put here at least one, at least a week. So, you spent you've you've had an adventure. The session ended. You're coming back in the next session, and it's a month later, say, um, and you have been practicing. You know, you've been working. You've been working in your career. You have this um, skill that you've been trying to like focus on while you've been doing that. You get a little, you get, like tick the box. And therefore, if you want to go from um, novice up to adept, you would need to have done that twice, two periods of downtime before you can do that. And to get up to master, you then you then, like kind of it kind of wipes the slate clean, and you have to go up to you have to do it three more periods of downtime to get up to master. So that's. Again, this is all going to be play testing. This is a kind of you know er, early early look at things. Um, any other skill that you want to do, you can do this with any other skill, um, not just your key skills, the ones tied to your career. But you need to. Um, it takes twice as long. So, yeah, if you're a farmer and you want to increase um, fishing, the idea is you're not going to have as much time to to focus on the fishing because it's not your career. Um, so it's going to take you twice as long to to learn it. Um, then finally, I've said learning many new skills will require teaching from a mentor, likely requiring some form of payment or obligation unless you are turning in a favor. So I'm kind of just making a few points here of saying there are some narrative hooks that can be brought in here, obligation and favors. So this is something when um, you know players are clever and they're playing the game, they help somebody out. They could say, right, you owe me one now. And then later on, they can say, right, I want to I want to learn how to basket weave. Um, that's why I'm turning my favor for you to teach me how to basket weave. They then then can um, learn the skill of basket weaving by taking two periods of downtime because it's not a career skill to learn it and go up one rank. All right. Finally, we've got changing careers. And this is where I've made a big change from before. I had in the career section, I, have, I did have these tags where I was looking at experience points and moving within related careers would... Um, give you a, a like a smaller cost whereas moving between two unrelated careers would cost more experience 
I don't really, it's a bit too mechanized for what I want. I want this to be a little bit lighter weight. And because of that, I just want the, I want the careers to feel a little bit more narrative. And if it makes sense for you to take a new, take on a new career, you should be allowed to take on the new career. Um, and it should make sense within the story. So I don't want it to just be, I'm spending the experience points. I am now a rat catcher. Okay, who's teaching you rat catching? There's been no rat catching NPCs in this game so far. Oh, I'm just going to invent an NPC to do it. Or I'm going to become a apprentice wizard. <laughs> you know, that sort of thing. It ties it back into the narrative. It ties it back into the story. And there needs to be some sort of logic to how this works. So changing careers, I've put here, you must have a mentor for the new career and spend time to increase one of its key skills by one, regardless of your current skill levels. So that means, um, I'm, I've made that point because if you are moving from a, as a farmer into herder, right? A herder, like a shepherd or something like that, they share, um, I think they share two skills, but one skill they certainly share is animal care because they're both caring for animals often. And if you've been playing a farmer for a while and you've got animal care too, you could say, okay, I'm, I want to change career to herder. I want to become a shepherd. I already have... Animal care too, which is one of the which is one of the skills for the uh, for the shepherd. So I'm instantly a, a shepherd now. No, that's not how it works. You still need a mentor, and you still need to increase one of the shepherds or one of the herders' skills by one. And that's why I've said regardless of your current skill level. So if you wanted to increase your, I mean, you wouldn't do this, but if you wanted to increase your animal care to three, it would take you six downtime events to do that because it's technically not your career skill for you to increase that by one so that you could then become you could then take on the new career so this is kind of how this is working it's going to take time to learn the new career and the idea here is that if you already have some skill then it's i yeah anyway um it's going to take you longer oh god see that doesn't make sense then if you have let's say you have one you've done some um you've done you've done some career swapping already let's say you have at least one rank in all of the career skills relating to the new career you want to take. Theoretically, it shouldn't take you that long to learn it. Because you already know the key skills relating to it. But according to what I've written here, you'd have to up you'd have to get one of them to rank two to start. Yeah, I'm gonna get rid of that. Yeah, we're gonna change this because that doesn't make sense because the the better the more skilled you are It shouldn't take you more time to learn the skill It should take you less time or the same amount of time So I guess I guess what I'll be saying here is you have to have a new you have to have a mentor for the new career and You have to spend time Not to increase one of the key skills. We're just gonna say you don't get any skill increases You have to, you must have a mentor for the new career and spend time learning the basics Regardless of your current skill levels, skill ranks. The career, okay, so here's a, this doesn't make any sense. The career gained, oh, you gain the career once you've gained one rank, no. Nope. You obtain, I guess? You obtain the new career once you have spent two periods of downtime. No, we'll spend one period of downtime. Um, training. You are then free to advance the key skills relating to the new career. The new career's key skills are now available to you to advance at the reduced rate. However, your previous career skills, your previous career's key skill, career skills are no longer considered key skills for the purpose of advancement. 
Um, adapt your character sheet to reflect this. Okay. Hey, Magnus. Yeah, I tell it, but that's I don't need to I don't need to mechanize that. The whole point of this is that it should be um, narrative. So you can't learn a career unless you have a mentor. So it's either going to be somebody in the village or it's going to be somebody passing through the village. That like say there's a passing min minstrel, they can they can spend a period of downtime if you if you can agree if they agree to do it, for you to learn their to, for you to learn their the basics of their trade. So I don't want to I don't want to mechanize it too much with the village. It's kind of assumed you're going to be in the village, and that's kind of what what's required. Um, so Geraldfar and Magnus, if you look up a little bit in the chat, there's a link. I'm actually sharing a quick sneak peek of the playtest document if any, if you want to have a look at it. Um, this is a soft release of the playtest. I think it's ready for people if they want to try and have a look at it or play it. Um, that's fine, but there's still quite a few things to do before I want to do a full proper, um, you know, official playtest release. Um, so this is just to kind of reward people who've been watching live. I've also shared it on the Discord uh, server for this channel because there's a lot of discussion around uh, a kind of in-between um, episodes where we talk about, where I'm kind of asking for advice and talking about my development as I'm working on it. Yeah. Um, what do you mean by tasks? Um, oh. Any feedback? Um, I've got the I've got the sharing permission set to comment, so literally anything you want to comment on, whether it's typos or um, inconsistency, grammar, wording, filling in blanks. Like um, there's a bunch of tables here that I haven't filled out here. I've put like item question mark. So this is uh, formative events, and I've filled in like all the skills I want you to learn through these formative events, but I haven't put the um, the kind of narrative thing that ties to it. Or an item for all of them, so that kind of needs to be that kind of needs to be filled in. So um, Harry, who's the artist um, for Pitchfork, he's already suggested two. Um, you know, he's he's actually filled in two of these formative events for me, which is quite nice. Um, I mean, that's kind of feels a little bit like cheating, like um, crowdsourcing, um, crowdsourcing some of the writing. But I don't really care. Like, if you wanna if you wanna try and put a little bit of a like add a little bit to it and you're happy for me to use it in a, what will be a paid product go for it i'm not gonna i'm not gonna complain yeah that's fine i mean if you got too much on your plate it's fine this is literally just if people want to look at it people want to try playing it absolutely fine there's obviously no no obligation at all for anybody to to look at it um anyway let's move on so um yeah that was a big change with the advancement uh and tying it to that i'm just gonna i'm gonna jump quickly to careers um, I've changed how I've structured things slightly. So careers here are now, this is what happens. In fact, we'll look at character creation because this is a little bit different as well. Um, I've, you can see here in the outline, there's, there's nine steps to character creation. Um, upbringing is the first one. So we've gone full life path here. Um, I, I wanted to do this. I want to implement this from the, from the get go. I didn't want to have it be point by. I really, really wanted to have some form of, um, you know, sim, uh, some sort of, some form of, um, life path event system to create your character very similar to how free league have done it in forbidden lands and uh, vazen but i wanted to have it a little bit more open um because if you've played either of those games you've created characters using the life path systems in either of those games um you have basically like careers or classes or archetypes whatever they're called in the various games roles and you have formative events that are tied specifically to those like a d6 table tied to those very specifically and I wanted to make it a little bit more generic and just have a D66 kind of villager-based formative events table that anybody of any of these careers could have had when they were growing up. So I've done a, I've done this D66 formative events table. Likewise, there's an upbringing that it doesn't like. There's only humans in this. There aren't any um, there aren't any kind of demi-human races. So everyone just rolls a D6 for your upbringing. Anyway, so the idea is you can you can basically roll 
a random, you can randomly roll for every single step on here, or you can choose at every step if you really want. It doesn't really make much of a difference. Um, first step is upbringing. You get, just checking that I've changed the names here. That's correct. Phys physique and dexterity um, are correct now. Good. Um, you get a spread here, and this is very deliberately chosen so that it's basically three is average, and threes across the board um, is basically how it is for everyone. But I've looked at them as blocks of three physical and three mental uh, characteristics. And I've tried to keep nine points for, for, all, for all of these, all six of these options. There's nine points distributed amongst the physical options, and there are nine points distributed amongst, amongst the mental. So the characters are a little bit balanced between the two, and I don't want to have a character that's extremely overly balanced towards the physical side, necessarily. However, it's super easy to just create your own upbringing. If you want to say, I don't really like any of these, how about if I had an upbringing where I was um, enslaved, or I don't know, something else. And you could just literally come up with a way to distribute 18 points between those um, six, and come up with a skill. What's the skill you have? And that's basically the first step of upbringing. You have you have these 18 points distributed as shown here, and you get one skill at rank one. Secondary characteristics then, which are vitality and stability. I'm leaving this up to people to decide, and basically you have seven points that you can distribute between those two. So the only restriction is that values have to be between two and five. So you could go two on one and five on the other, but I'm thinking most people would probably do three and four. Okay, so that way I didn't want to keep it even. It's basically you have to pick one to be slightly higher than the other. So are you are you tougher or are you more stable? Are you more, um, yeah, I guess stable is quite a good word actually. Um, do you have more of a grip on reality? That sort of thing. And that's completely up to you to decide. Then you roll for your career. And when you roll for your career, there's a D66 table, but I only have um, 18 options. So it's like half, so it's, you know, two, two results on, um, on the D66 roll. For every for every one and i basically just provided here at the top like the idea is you're you're assumed to be 18 years old now you roll for your career i should i said 18 but it should be maybe a little bit older what did i put for age i'll say 16. yeah so that's basically you you this is your upbringing as a child you're then 16 this is your career and this is what you get with your career. You get one point to the list of characters, characteristic. So these 18 points go up to 19 because you get an extra one. And that does mean it, there's the potential that, like, for example, if you play a, a peasant upbringing and a farmer, your physique is four. Physique is the farmer's characteristic. You're, you're going to have a physique of five. So you're going to be very, very strong, right? You're going to have a very strong physique um, because you grew up being a big burly peasant lad and you went into the farming business like you're you're one of the strongest people around um likewise if you're a tinkerer and you go with artisan artisan is dexterity you would have a five in dexterity You'd be very dexterous very good with your hands um so there is this is where the possibility of getting a five at characterization is possible however the overall spread of number of points between these is much lower than as i said as i've said before than typical uh year zero games Okay, and that's the only that's the only characteristic bonus you get in the game. So once that is set, you have um, you have 19 characteristic points between those six. Actually, that's not quite true. One career, the charcoal burner, gives you a plus one to vitality, and that's because I was thinking about this for a while. And the charcoal burner is absolutely one of the shittest careers imaginable. Like it is terrible. It's been hard for me to think about what kind of skills to give it. Everything else, it's just not a great career and one of the things i was thinking about was you know what do i assign like how do i make it different to the woodcutter because there was some there was some shared uh, there's kind of some synergy between the woodcutter and the um and the charcoal burner how do i make them different the woodcutter definitely has physique as its as its characteristic um because that's like a, a lumberjack right they're big and strong they're chopping trees down all the time they're lugging lugging logs and trees around they're very very strong um so how do I differentiate the woodcutter and uh, sorry the charcoal burner and the charcoal burner is basically they're going to be tough they're spending a lot of time outdoors manning the um, 
you know, watching over the charcoal pile, this like pyre that they've created with the charcoal. And this thing can explode, like it can, it, um, or like catch, like massively catch on fire. It's super hot inside and they cannot fall asleep while they're keeping an eye on it. They have to keep it like smoldering to create that charcoal. And because of that, I imagine that they've had lots of, they've, they've been burned a lot. They have had lots of kind of um, horrible things happen to them and they're pretty tough generally. So I really wanted to put toughness in all, only on that one. So every every single one of the other careers has one of these six as the attribute that gets advanced. And the charcoal burner has vitality as theirs. So they're going to be a little bit tougher than anyone else. And I'm kind of happy with how that like how that, that works. There is still the... Um... I didn't mention it here. I'll put it next to the career here. Charcoal burner, vitality. And then in brackets... Um... I, um, cannot be higher than five. Simple. And because you're choosing your vitality and your stability spread, that means if you had chosen five and two, you would just say, okay, I've, I'm, I've rolled or I've chosen the charcoal burner. That's fine. I'm going to stay with 5, but then it's not going to be 5 and 2. It's going to be 5 and 3. i got to put my stability up by 1. I mean, I don't need to write that in. I don't think it should be pretty straightforward. Okay. So, you then take one rank to each of the listed skills. So, we've got to drop back down again to one of the careers. Let's look at um, Boater, because I'm there. Physique is a character, so you take one to that. You get one point for each of these. You get, um, they're able to, they're good at rowing. They're good at sleight of hand. Uh, which is things like tying knots and that sort of thing. Um, not super happy with that, but it is, it's fine. I, I'm, I'm just going to leave this as I've got them all listed out. Um, and swimming, obviously. Then trappings. You take, you get each of the trappings. You get a boat hook, you get a waxed raincoat, and you get a rowboat. And I think that's it. Yeah. I'm going to remove this because I'm actually going to be changing this now. I didn't want to create different... Um, I didn't want to... I was originally going to do different uh, motivations and problems per career. But I actually want to make it more open. And I want people... I want to have D66 options for both motivations and problems. And that people have a much... Either choose from those lists or come up with... Or roll randomly. And that way you're not limited to picking one of three that are really reinforcing stereotypes. I want people to really come up with original characters or roll randomly, have a bigger pool to, to choose from to do that. Hey, Eric. Cool. Yeah, the oars are included with the the rowboat. <laughs> uh, always got to be one. Rowboat with oars. How's that? <laughs> All right. Okay. I've said here, and should be underlined on your character sheet as advancing will be easier than other skills. So I've actually said to underline them. Um, remove the underlining on your old careers key skill. Okay. <laughs> That's a good question. Why would you roll for knots? Um, the idea is you wouldn't necessarily have to, but the idea is that they're good at rolling. They're good at tying knots. So their sleight of hand, their sleight of hand is their like uh, manual dexterity with their with their hands, right? So sleight of hand is doing like little little things, uh, quick movements with their hands. And the idea is because they're good at like tying knots and they're good at like doing those kind of small movements that they have higher sleight of hand. But it, thinking about that doesn't actually really make a lot of sense. So. Um, but yeah, I'm leaving it for now anyway because I spent hours and hours getting those skills right, and I don't really want to touch them anymore. So, if anybody has any suggestions, they can make com they can like leave the comments there. I'll probably end up looking at the skills again at some stage. Um, but yeah, yeah. Okay. So they're the careers. I haven't changed them. Um, the only thing I've changed is I had this called the midwife dash healer, and I've changed that to midwife stroke leech. A leech is the name of a healer that would use leeches to um, to leech people uh, to <laughs> remove their ill humors. Um, 
so I'm leaning into that as the court sort of like a midwife leech. I'm kind of giving like a male and a female uh, alter alternate eh, alternatives to the same sort of career. So we could say me a medicine bag or jar of leeches. So one thing I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be removing all this stuff here. So the, the actual stat lines for all of these are going to be a lot lower. I'm not going to do that on stream, but that's something I will be doing eventually. i just do finish this one for the minstrel. In fact, I'll just do it for the bottom ones now because I've started and I'm near the bottom. Okay. All right, let's do one more so I can uh, get that onto the next page and I don't want to be wasting a whole page of stuff. There we go, okay. All right, where was I? Character creation, so that was career. Formative events then. Formative events, you roll for it. This occurred during your adolescence, I've said. Add the listed skill and trapping to your character sheet. So for example, you rolled 12. Village Minstrel liked your face, coerced you into acting in many of his sketches. You learn, you get one skill in acting, and you get a colorful cloak. Anyway, so that's the idea. Very simple, that's what happens. Then, we get down to age. If you are sticking with being young, that's it. You don't have to change anything else. You just roll a d6 and you add that to 18 to get your age, right? So pretty straightforward, your age is going to be between the, the numbers um, 19 and 24. Um, I might even change that just so it's easier to work it out and make it 20, d6 plus 20. So you're going to be between the ages of 21 and 26. And maybe I'll change adult to be 30. Not that, not that if you're under 31, <laughs> you're not an adult. But the idea, ah, nay, I'm going to leave it as I, as I had it. So 18 to 24, you're considered young. 19 to 24, you're considered young. Um, 25 plus 2d6. Yeah, so if you're between the ages of 27 and... Um, yeah, and 37. You're considered an adult. And if you are between the ages of 42 and 52, you're considered old. Um, and each of those, at each of those stages, so if you decide you're going to be an adult, you roll a second time on the formative events table, so you get another skill and you get another, um, trapping, but then you also reduce your, either your vitality or your stability by one. So this is where I've, this is where I've, um, diver diverged a little bit from the four attributes in Forbidden Lands and Vazen, where you reduce one of your main four attributes. The idea here is that your vitality is like how how your health and your toughness and your stability is your mental alacrity and like how your willpower and your mental strength. And that's how I wanted to handle this. I wanted it to be that those go down and not your actual core attributes. So you're, the older you get, the more likely it is that you're going to get injured more quickly. The more likely it is that you're going to um, get scared more easily, potentially, if you, you decide to lower your stability, that sort of thing, right? Um, and I like that. I like that better. I like that better than reducing your your overall. Even though it can make sense to say I'm not as strong as I used to be, but if you're looking at a 32 year old farmer who's grown up as a peasant and has become a, has been a farmer his whole life, um, he's not going to be less strong than a 22 year old farmer. He's still going to be just as strong because he's still in those fields doing the same thing day in day out and in fact you find i mean i live i live in the countryside i'm surrounded by farms myself um my uncle-in-law is and is still a farmer he's almost 70 and he is bloody strong he's much stronger than me because he's been a farmer his whole life he's constantly like working with tractors fixing tractors doing stuff with fields he's had um animals as well he's a very strong guy and it doesn't make sense that necessarily one of his other one of those sort of stats should go down he certainly is gets injured more often like if he he's he had a, a crash with his bike and he he hurt himself and it took him a lot longer to get better than it would normally that sort of thing so i like this a lot i like this this way of doing it a lot better it makes a little bit more sense to me 
Um, so that's how we're doing it. And old does exactly the same thing again. You get a roll a third time on the formative events table, and this is the final time, and you then reduce either your vitality or stability again by one. So yeah. Yeah, it leads, like, you're past old, right? That's I, This is something I kind of figured out as well. Like, I am 39 years old. I'm turning 40 in a few months. Um, so I'm kind of technically on the verge of being adult and old. I don't consider myself old, but um, you look at the medieval ages and the life expectancy was a lot lower. The life expectancy was something like around, I think, like the late 40s, early 50s, depending on exactly when you're looking in the medieval, um, like, which, which part of the Middle Ages. Um, but that's the idea, is that, like, you're considered old at a at an earlier rate because of healthcare and all the rest of it so yeah yeah they didn't have exactly they didn't like i'm in germany right so like we've got really good healthcare here and this seven-year-old farmer is is like that but that's the whole point like it's gonna be he's considered old this farmer at the age of 42 right i'm, I'm gonna be 42 in three years two and a half two and a bit years actually um I'm a little bit rickety, but I don't consider myself like the same, the same, like, st uh, anyway, I'm going to, I'm digging myself into a hole here, but yeah, anyway, I really like this idea. I really want to, I want to play test to see how it works. I want to look at how people come up with characters like this. And I, I like the, the concept that you're still as effective at doing things when you're older as younger people, but it's just when the shit hits the fan, you're going to theoret, you could theoretically be, um, f you know, getting broken a lot sooner. And the idea being that the young, the young ones are the ones who are able to take a licking and keep on ticking, um, or they're not as phased by things that would kind of like shatter the mind of somebody who's been around a little bit more. Um, again, I'm generalizing a lot of things, but I kind of like I kind of like this as a concept. So that was a new thing, by the way, the age. That's why I'm mentioning it so much. Names. I've created a massive name table. I've put it in an appendix because it's massive, and here it is. Um, it's right at the b bottom of the document. I have um, D66 table here with 36 masculine names, 36 feminine names, 36 gender neutral names, and then two lots of surnames. And I've gone for a very specific flavor here. The names are a mix of Nordic and Germanic names. I've tried to go for ones that are a little bit, um, a little bit more... A little bit older, old-fashioned, and not necessarily modern ones. And I've also gone for ones that are a little, hopefully, easy to pronounce with an English tongue. Um, so I was very being quite selective with the ones I was I was choosing. Um, surnames, however, because this is theoretically based in Germany, but a Norse Empire influenced Germany, I wanted the surnames to be Germanic, and I've gone for ones that aren't tied to. Um, parents, like Nordic names often were, so like um, Sigurds Dottir or um, that sort of thing, you know, um, Svensson, that sort of thing, um, which was very common in the kind of uh, the Middle Ages for the Nordic countries and also actually for um, for the kind of Northern Europe as well. Germany, there's a lot of, there were people who had like, um, I don't know, um, someone's Tochter or something like that in their surname. Um, or man, that's where man came from. Our son, sorry. Um, I think there's some zone. Jan zone? Nee. Uh, maybe not. Maybe it's not such a Germanic thing. Uh, I looked this up a while ago. I can't remember. It certainly doesn't really happen these days. But um, anyway, I was going for things that I looked up a bunch of names that were a little bit more uh, neutral, that weren't tied to occupation. So I didn't go for things like Bawa or... Uh, Maya or names like that which are specifically tied to occupations. So these are all very generic surnames. Oh, that's actually one thing I wanted to do. Let me put, add that to my, my to-do list at the top here. Is um, add an occupational surname to each career. So if you want, a, like, if, you, if you're a farmer you have the option of taking the surname Bauer, Bauer, um, because that's that's the German word for farmer. Um, or you can roll on the, or you can roll on this massive table here, and you've got seventy-two options of surnames. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's something I've that's something I, I spent a lot of time um, kind of pulling together. I'm quite happy with how it's turned out. I had some feedback from Discord um, from two Nordics. 
um, one from Norway and one, um, which is um, one of the people in chat here, and uh, another another guy who's um, half Swedish, half Finnish. So they kind of gave me some tips and kind of scrubbed this a little bit to kind of remove some and change some others. Like I didn't have Harald in there as a name, and that was you know a gross oversight not to have Harald in there. Um, Anyway, I think Holmfast was was a different one. So we've replaced Holmfast with Harold, for example. Anyway, let's go back to character creation. God, I've been talking for nearly an hour, and I haven't even started doing anything. I'm just talking about what I've changed, because I've made a lot of changes. Nearly done. Personality traits. As I said, I put them in here. I haven't started putting anything in here yet, so that'll be a to-do feature. Uh, distinctive features, I've done this as well, so I've gone through and had to think about, looked up stuff. I'm not actually copying from other places, I've kind of, um, I had to look at some online, um, like, writer's resources where they're, like, we're talking about, like, how to think about these things, so looking at them from perspective of looking at people's, um, like, their hair, their eyes, their chins, their mouths, their, their ears, all this sort of stuff. Um, and coming up with coming up with distinctive features. So I've gone for things that aren't necessarily really punitive or really really extreme. So for example, you have large ears, you have bushy eyebrows. There's no mono brows like you know having just one eyebrow going all the way across. They're they're kind of a bit more minor. Some of them are a bit worse, and obviously some people are going to probably get triggered by some of these, and some of them will be quite offensive to some people. I can't avoid that. This is a very flavorful thing that um, that's part of Warhammer that I really like, and yeah, it is what it is. So the idea here is that you're normal people with some distinguishing feature. Yeah, nobody's perfect, right? And um, yeah, that's what that is there. And then bonds is just basically you come up with, um, I'll give some examples, but the idea is you come up with one of the other PCs that you consider a friend, and then one of the NPCs that you created during village creation or was involved in a formative event, what's the positive bond you have with them? So you're creating two bonds with two characters. Okay. Hey, collabs. Um... <laughs> I've literally just finished doing a recap of all the things I've changed. If you scroll up in the chat, you will find a link to this playtest document, which I'm doing a soft release for here on the um, here on the stream. For people watching the stream and people in the Discord server. Um, I'm asking everyone, please don't share this link out beyond because I want to I want to tidy this up a bit, make it a bit tighter, fill in a lot of the gaps before I release it to the kind of wider world. So this is really just for people who've been following along. 14 di dev diary episodes in now and it's at a state where theoretically you could play it if you're happy to fill in a lot of blanks and things um, it's also open to commenting so if you want to leave any comments feel free as well and I'll see those okay so the one thing I really wanted there's a there are a few other little changes I've made um, mainly I've tidied up the the outline here I've removed you can like remove elements of the outline by hitting the X um, it shows every heading header level by default. So if I was to put in here under Boater, I was to put a gap in here and say um, test. And I want to change that to be a level 5 header. You can see right here it's got test listed. So anytime you make a header, it lists it in your outline. And I didn't want that. I wanted because it's you're scrolling forever to get through it. So I kind of um, removed anything other than a level 1 or a level 2 header. And in the case of careers, I removed all of the careers because it was a big list of 36. And I just thought, if you want to look up a career, you click on careers, then you find it. Um, the rest of it was a little bit more important. I thought it needed to be left in. Anyway, I'm going to jump down to conflict now because this is one of the things I wanted to do today. Um, and look at injury tables and torment tables. And what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to stick these in the appendix at the back. So my appendix B is going to be my injury table. Oh, God. And I actually, what I want is I want this to be... I'm going to use this as an example here. I want it to be a full 36 entry D66 table. So I'm going to drop the font size down to 11. I'm going to make the table a little bit more snug. Still won't fit on one table on one um one piece of paper and that's fine. Okay. 
And we're going to unmerge this. And move this over. To about there, which... Okay. Nice. Perfect. Okay. This can come over as well. Select this. I'm going to get rid of that little indent. Make it center justified and we're going to pop in the numbers here voila all right now how do you create an injury table how do you create create a critical injury table well I'm going to be looking for inspiration at other Year Zero games. I'm also going to be looking at the Wolfrup, the various Wolfrup tables that have been created. Um, ooh, I hope my stream is okay. Yep. Yeah. Um, Specifically, some of the fan-created stuff. So, if I open a new window here and I go to, um, I think it's the Winds of Chaos website. Winds of Chaos Critical Injuries. There we go. Here we have some crazy critical injury tables. Um, I've actually got these all downloaded, um, but the idea here is that this has critical injury tables for bladed, blunt, arrows, and firearms. But you get on here, they're, they're like different different options, right? These are the official ones from the Winds of Chaos website here. Official, sorry. Unofficial ones from this website. But that somebody else um, called Joseph or Yosef, I'm not sure exactly who this person is. They've created extended ones that are have things like... Arrows and bolts, blunt, bullet, cutting, flame and energy, piercing, shrapnel, teeth and claw, unarmed, winged, quadruped, etc. It's a lot. Thankfully, I've got all these saved already on my machine, so I'm going to go ahead and open those up. Open one of them up. But they're very flavorful. And the idea here is that I want 36 injuries... I want to lay. I also want to have some structure with how I'm putting them in. So this is probably some of the design elements I should probably talk about before I start just sticking stuff in. So if I go here and I say um, design, uh, design goals. So they need to be in ascending order of severity, and roughly. I mean, I'm not gonna. It's not. Everyone's going to have a different idea on what's a worse injury, of course, uh, more or less. Like, losing an arm is going to be worse than getting a broken nose. Um, but, yeah. Um, all must be injuries. No stuns. No temporary stuns. Um, how did... I was, how was I doing death? Let me just look that up very quickly. I haven't mentioned death, other than a coup de gras. Okay, that's fine. Um, I did have an idea that, I haven't added this in, but I had an idea that for every existing injury that you had, you had to move one level down on the injury table. So if you have two existing injuries, the next time you take an injury, you roll your dice, and then you add two. You can't really add two if, because it's D66. If you roll a 16, adding two makes you think, all right, I rolled an 18. There's no 18 entry. It would be two slots down on the table. But that's something I was playing around with the idea of. And because of that, I kind of like that idea, especially if they're laid out in a way where they're um, in kind of ascending order of severity. So the more injured you are, the more likely you're going to be taking worse injuries. Um, and it also then means I can add just a single instant death 
injury to this table at 66. But the more you're injured, the more likely it is that you're, that you're going to land on that. You're going to be instantly killed. Because if you roll then a 64 or 65 and you've got two injuries, you're going to be bumped up to the 66 point. So I wanted to have it so that um, only one only one instant death entry. And that's more or less it, design-wise, design goal-wise. Um, yeah, Genesis style. I've, I've played a ton of uh, Fantasy Flight games. I've run a lot of Fantasy Flight games, Star Wars, Edge of the Empire. Um, and I, that's something I really liked. Although it's a little bit too c cinematic, it's not um, gritty enough. Um, but I like the concept of the more the more critical injuries you have, the more likely it is the next one's going to be more severe. So I'm definitely borrowing that from from sort of the Genesis system. Okay, so I mean basically the the last one here I'm just going to put in here instant death um, in brackets because I'm going to actually try and make this flavorful. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put in what the actual injury is. I'm not going to put it in a sentence. And then I will think about having some sort of colorful sentence for how that injury is. I'm, I'm still on the fence about whether I want to do that. But I want to try and mechanize this first, for specifically for play testing. Um, and the the kind of pros can come at a later stage. Especially because I've got like an hour left in the stream. I'll probably go over the hour anyway. Um, and I want to try and I want, kind of want to try to battle through this. I'm just going to stick it in here so I don't forget. I also want to do this for what I'm calling torments. Torments being... Um, the mental the mental injuries okay right let's crack open some woof rip stuff we'll open the um the Forbidden Lands one as well. Oh, one other thing I wanted to do design design goal wise, um, only one injury table, not separate ones for weapon damage for weapon types or damage types, I should say. This means injuries need to be written in such a way that they are uh, generically applicable. That means I'm not going to write an entry that says like um, severed, severed arm because if you are rolling an injury table in a grapple with somebody, most people aren't going to be able to rip, to sever an arm off in an injury, like that sort of thing. Um, but it might be something like a ruined arm. And that could be either it gets severed if you're using a bladed weapon, or it could be you've wrenched it completely off and broken it so badly that it's it's unusable, um, like permanently useless. And probably would get amputated, potentially, because of, um, think of like bones, jagged bones inside their poking around Ugh. all right so woof up second edition i think is where it is and community supplements critical hit tables let's have a look at this so this is the winds of chaos one it looks like which is fine Fifteen entries each, right? Um, that's because you have this table, this like chart on the side, and yeah, the severity is determined by where you roll on the chart. Now, this is something I could actually consider. I actually quite like this with um, with earlier editions of of Warhammer. Um, you have a tighter spread of, of what kind of what kind of injuries you can you can suffer. It means there's not a lot of kind of weak ones kind of thrown into the mix. They they can be quite flavorful. As you can see here, with 15, you can fit a nice, the physical, like a nice, descriptive, gory description in a single column on a sheet of paper, or in my case, it'd probably be a single page. Um, but like, look at this one: arrows and bolts. They have results, 15 results for if it's on your arm, if it's on your head, 
if it's on your body or on a leg. Then you got bladed weapons, the same for like style, and they're all very, very, very flavorful. Um, it actually isn't going to work for what I'm trying to do. It's way too, it's way too detailed. Um, so I'm actually going to open up Vazen first. I mean, I've got the, the physical book right next to me, but I'll open the PDF. All right. Fourth edition of Warhammer might be worth looking at, and I think third edition Player's Guide has a table as well, rather than the cards. So I could look at those two for some good ideas. In fact, the third edition had some really had some really nice ones. Uh, Vazen, Vazen, Vazen. We were looking at conflict and injuries. We're looking at uh, injuries, critical injuries. There we go. All right. Now I quite like. Vazen basically is doing exactly what I what I want, right? It ha you have the injury. It's a fairly, um, it's a fairly loose description of what the injury is. You know, ear injury. You can narrate what that is, and I kind of like I kind of like how this works, right? Um, again, not always applicable. Um, punctured eye. I, mean, I guess you can puncture it, someone's eye if you're grappling with them. You can stick a finger in it. Um, burst archery. Coma. Spinal injury. Torn abdomen. How would you tear somebody's abdomen if you're grappling them? That's this for me is the is the big question, right? <laughs> um, grappling. How is how are you doing these serious injuries if you're grappling somebody? And maybe there's. I have actually handled this a little bit in the in the rules already, and maybe I can add a little bit more to it. Um, ah. I'm not sure how I feel about this. But anyway, I'll show you what I've done. Unarmed attacks. So. The idea is any damage you do reduces vitality normally. So you're still able to injure somebody the same way as you would normally. But the defender gets advantage to their trauma roll to resist getting an injury. So whenever you're rolling a trauma roll, that's you roll your, your current... Vit you reduce the vitality by how much damage you took, and then you roll your remaining vitality pool to see... And if you get a success, you don't suffer an injury. If you fail that, that vitality roll, you suffer an injury. And it means you're going to be suffering injuries quite often. Um, however, this one, for example, is saying... When you're making that roll, you get to add advantage. You get an extra dice that you can add to that to to roll. Um, what I could also say is, if an injury is is inflicted, um, whatever's rolled, you move up two steps in the injury table. For example, it does mean like if I'm adding another rule then later for um, for moving up when you're when you have already have some injuries, then that kind of two-way moving is slightly going to get slightly annoying. Um, but I kind of feel like maybe that might be a way to handle it. But I think I'm going to leave it out for now. I'm going to leave it out for now. Yeah, Genesis did go beyond 100. I'm, I'm aware. It did... Um... Yeah, be even more generic is a way to handle it. So I think for now I'm going to stick with the Vazen approach and I'm going to make it, make it relatively generic to start with. And then I can always... I mean, this. I'm planning on taking this to Kickstarter in the future. This game, um, and this could be a this could be a a stretch goal um, because the amount of time it'll take to write this is reasonably significant. I think. Well, I don't know, um, but it could just be a fun little like social stretch goal or something. Maybe to like make them a bit more, or I can make expanded um, injury tables. What you know, a separate injury table for separate weapon types as a. As like an expansion or something. So if you want them, there's this expansion, extra tables to roll on. Like Forbidden Lands has, basically. Um, if I could go to town on it then. Okay. I think I've answered everything in this stream there. Types of injuries. I've said that already with this. I don't want to have different damage types. Um... Go by steps instead of numbers. 
yeah, I mean that's kind of what I was talking about is having this having steps like you step up or down on on the on the list rather than adding things um, adding adding numbers to your roll. I'm gonna stick with it with it as it is, and I'm gonna add in this thing. I'm gonna do that before I forget. Actually, uh, go up to trauma. Come down to injury. Yeah. That's that's worth pointing out. Note to say that if the result doesn't make sense, an injury of equivalent severity should be inflicted. Okay. One other thing to note here. Um, this is all. This should all be highlighted. I have said here it should be written as blunt force trauma, but I'm not, I don't think that's necessarily true. Using Vazen for inspiration. And the one thing I wanted to add in here, which I was just saying, is um, each uh, injuries take their toll. For each injury you are already suffering, when taking an injury, Oh, how do I write this? <laughs> um, when making the... When rolling on the injury table. If you already have... If you are already suffering from other... From previous injuries... You must move your result down the table a number of slots equal to your current number of injuries. I'll wordsmith that later. Okay, just wanted to get that in there. Okay, let's have a look then at Vazen. Vazen, Vazen, Vazen. Foot injury. Now, this is the other thing I liked about Vazen is that they had this, um, this, this kind of def this defect that you could get from um, both your critical, physical, and your mental critical injuries, uh, which were like ongoing, ongoing, yeah, ongoing defects. And I kind of want to do something similar. Um, I mean, I'm tempted to just take the Vazen critical injury table, whole cloth, and port it over, at least for playtesting. Um, and then kind of scrub it later. Um, let me look through it. So we got a foot injury. We have broken fingers. We have a ruptured tendon. We have a knee injury, a fracture, splinters in the body. What does that mean? Splinters in the body. Splinters of what? Okay. Like something is left in the body from an injury, so you... You get hit by an arrow and some there's some wood splinters in your body or you're wearing armor and a piece of leather gets cut as it's as you're being injured and that's like left in your body somewhere I guess I'm not sure about that one a skin lesion damaged throat eye injury injured arm facial injury crush injury dislodged teeth Ear injury, jaw injury, back injury, severed fingers, nerve damage, torn ear, abdominal injury, dirty wound, bleeding wound, crushed genitals, punctured eye, ruptured bowel, deep arm gash. Yeah, bone splinters, maybe. <laughs> um, Groldfar is asking in chat, would I go beyond D66? Like beyond the 36 things I've got there. I don't think I would. That's how Genesis does it. Um, so I could effectively... And I have actually played around with doing this in a previous um, a previous game I was prototyping. Because I, did, I do actually like this. So I could basically say here, for example, 71, 72, 73, 74, 75, 76. Right? And the idea here is that for each existing injury, add 10... To your result yeah 
So if I then only put instant death here on a 76, if you already have an injury, if you roll a 60, so you're adding 10, right? So the only time you can die is if you get a 76. So if you have an existing injury, you'd have to roll a 66 to be dead, but it's only when you've already had a single injury. If you have two injuries, if you roll a 56 to 66, it's instant death. So it automatically starts getting much more deadly, right? If you have three injuries, if you roll a 41, so half the results that you could roll would result in you being dead. It starts getting a lot more um, deadly. But I don't see this as a problem because if you look at um, Tales from the, not Tales from the Loop, but Things from the Flood, the death mechanic there, it has a scar mechanic, and you roll on that every time you have a scar, and it's quite deadly as well, and it's a single d6. The more scars you have, the more likely it is you're going to die. And that could be a way to do it. Um, uh, I've done this for a previous one, and the, the, my problem is I find it hard to come up with this many injuries that are, that are very different, and I'm adding another six to the list by doing this. Um... Yeah, D66 table, I mean, that's just bonkers. It's like 216 or something entries. Um, no. <laughs> uh. What do I want to do here? What do I want to do here? Because I am tempted, I do like this. I do like this um, this way of doing it. It means that the first, it it downplays the lethality in the game, right? It makes it less deadly. It makes it a little bit more cinematic, and I'm not sure I want that, right? Um, anything, I'm, anytime I'm adding a mechanic here, it needs to be purposeful. And I think, as much as I like that, this might be a mechanic I add to my next game if I'm if my next game is Mouse Punk, because Mouse Punk is a little bit more cinematic. Um, but I still want it deadly, and that would be a perfect that'd be a perfect mechanic to do for my um, injury tables there. So I think I'm gonna leave it as it is now, um, and leave it where existing injuries move you down a slot. So it still gets more deadly the more injuries you have, but it's not quite as lethal as that. Yeah, I mean I've I've got it I've got it in there. I'm happy with that. Injuries equal. It's in there. It's in the rules already. This bit here. When rolling on the injury table, if you are already suffering from previous injuries, you must move your result down the table a number of slots equal to your current number of injuries. And then I'll provide an example here. That'll do. I'm just saying slots. That's fine. I don't really think it needs anything more than that. Okay, so injuries. Let's let's have a think about this. Um, what do I want to have? I want to have... I'm going to move over to here because it's a little bit easier to... to um, fiddle around with spreadsheets because I find it that way to do that to move things around and then I can um, I can copy and paste and drop it straight in so we've got um, uh, let me just copy and paste that very quickly from here Injury in effect. Okay. So, I want to have a broken nose. I want to have um, crushed foot. Okay. What, I what I'm trying to do, what I'm tending to do is I'm thinking of injuries that can happen when you are brawling with your fists, right? You can have a... Um, Broken bones. Uh, let's do a broken arm and a broken leg, because he's gonna have um, different mechanical repercussions. If your arm is broken, it's gonna affect your strength potentially. Um, you could have a crushed hand, it's gonna affect your dexterity. Broken leg is gonna affect your agility. Broken nose is going to affect your fellowship, maybe. Um, what's the 
for good or bad. Like, if you're trying to intimidate somebody, probably having a broken nose is going to help. Um, if you're trying to seduce somebody, um, it may or may not help. You never know. Um, depends on your game, I guess. I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole. Okay. So these are things that can heal. They're less lethal, right? Um, but I want them to be fairly fairly significant. Let's have a look at Vazen again. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of similar stuff here. I think. Okay, let's look at the head then. Um, we've got yeah, an eye injury. So you've got, we have already had the broken nose, your eyes could get damaged, your jaw, you could get a broken jaw. You could get a, um, an ear. What do you call that ear injury, I guess? Jaw injury. Defect drooling. <laughs> Uh, jaw injury. I think it's nice that they're just leaving it vague like this because if you're grappling with somebody and you give them a jaw injury, it's like, what kind of jaw? Like, describe the jaw injury you've inflicted. They go to town on it. You put the ball in the player's court. This is like going to the shared narrative sort of idea behind gaming, which I quite like. Um, and players will love, will rel most players will relish the idea of narrating how they've injured somebody or how they themselves have been injured based on something. Or the GM will relish the idea of describing how this person has attacked the player and the player character and they have an ear injury what does that mean has their ear been sliced off um is it been like is it cut in half something like that anyway um crushed hand i think is different to crushing injury we've got here you got a tremor which is affecting your ranged combat Oh, Ibram in chat is um, is speaking to me with a smaller injury table, 2D, 2D6 table, 11 results. Um, that's actually a quite a good idea because I can, you can add your number of injuries. Be ready if I'm going to do that. Add injuries to your result. Rolling a 12 is much lower. Like, it's much harder to roll a 12 than it is to roll D66. The, the, you've got this nice bell curve of probabilities. Um... Having a minor injury is also a lot less, so you're kind of getting results that are kind of like broken bones kind of can sort of be in the middle. And with it being 2d12, I could even have it... Yeah, I was thinking I could even do it by location. So I could do something like head, body, arm, and leg. But I don't think I want to go that route. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As my friend Liam would say... I'm picking up what you're putting down. <laughs> I'm going to do it over here. 2d6. Injury. And we're going to go with 2, 3, 4, etc. Down to 12. 11 results. Alright. Okay. Then the other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put a little probability table in here as well. So we're going to say, um, put it here equals 2 divided by is it 36 is that number of results on a 2d6 6 times 6 I believe uh, that's 1 isn't it fuck it I'm going to look up the probability chart here I have done this before in a spreadsheet, but I'm not going to try to remember how to do it. There we go. Oh, why can't I highlight this? Bloody CSS or HTML or whatever you're using here. All right. Paste. Oh, my God. What did I just do? 
Alright, this is what I want here. Okay. Okay. <sighs> Lovely jubbly. Alright, so these are the ones really I guess that are gonna be the, the ones I need to focus on. Four to ten. So we've been looking at seven. Well, that's definitely possible. So Seven being the highest likely one. Um, the li most likely damage is going to be a broken bone, I think. If you're... Um, as a base unit. Um, we're going to go with broken... <sighs> you know what? I Now that now that this has been mentioned, I almost want to go with... I know it's more <laughs> than a T36 table. But I kind of want to go with four different body parts. I want to go with head... Do I head, body, arms, and legs? So, for example, if this was the head, this would be a broken nose. The most likely result of, of getting hit in the getting hit in the face. The worst result would be um, crushed skull, which would be death. I need a way of <laughs> this is this is adding another feature I want I have put in a few times and taken out. I've been playing around with the idea of effect an effect die. And the idea is you roll a pool of dice, one of your die is always one of your dice is always a different color, and that is your effect die. Every time you roll any anything you're rolling, if you're rolling a D sixty six roll, you just roll one effect die and one other one and your effect die is always your tens digit, right? Um but it also means if you're doing an attack, like a combat roll, um, this can be your hit location dice as well. So there's a, quite a few little things you can do with this. Um, and I might add it back in <laughs> if I'm going to do, do hit locations with critical injuries. Um, think about it. Think about it. Because I don't want a separate roll to determine, to, to determine like... Um, hit location. I think it should be handled within the original role if possible. Or was I? Yeah, I'm not sure. Ah, okay, we're going to try it. We're going to try it. We're going to run with it. So this is going to be head. Broken nose, crushed skull, um, what else have we got here? Just for a bit of uh, cracked skull is a good one. Caved in forehead. Um, hmm, brain damage basically. <sighs> Punctured eye is pretty bad. talking about um blinded is bad concussion sure that's a good one right the lowest end Yeah, but you're over... Okay, so you're talking about tying up the... You're talking about tying up the injury with the actual roll, right? Low vitality already representing getting getting beat up, leading to greater ease of injury. You can always do a 2d6 where you add the two dice. I'm not sure which two dice you were talking about before, Eric. Um... Oh, 
Oh, where you add two dice, not the two dice. I was thinking, I was read that before as the two dice from the vitality roll. Um, see, that's the thing is like if you're if you're rolling the if you're rolling the the two d six for the injury roll. Ah, this is where this is where the effect die comes in. You roll that, so the effect die is one of the dice you're rolling with a two d six, and whatever the number coming up on the effect die is also the um, the. Um, no, because then it means, no, 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 that's not good. <laughs> Because if it's if it's determining the value, that means every time you roll low, low could theoretically be your head. Like if you're rolling a one on your effect die and that's your head, then it means that your head injuries are never going to be twelve. You'll never get a crushed skull because you would never get a twelve with a one on one of those dice. You'd never get over a seven, right? Um, so that wouldn't work. But yeah. So, um, a mediocre dad is working on a similar thing. It's um, a game called Flintlock, which is also kind of a woofer pack. And he's just said um, that he has every weapon has a damage table. And the severity increases on the table, so the last few results are the critical injuries. Yeah, that's... <laughs> How many weapons have you got? That sounds like a lot of work. <laughs> um, I mean, it's cool. It's a it's a very high level of granularity, um, and I'm trying to go the opposite route a little bit. Yeah, Gerald hitting a similar um, idea that I, I was looking at before with the Wolfrip ones, which is um, looking at weapon types, not necessarily not weapons, but also not necessarily um, even hit locations. So what we could say is we could say blunt might be a better way of doing it and then we're looking at basically the the forbidden lands approach blunt edged and piercing yeah there's stuff like fire i wouldn't do yeah i'm, I'm actually happy with fire not being on a critical injury on an injury table and having fire being handled in a different way um but there are things like, um, we can call it like Tooth and Claw. So if you're attacked by a wild animal and they get an injury on you, it's not piercing, it's not blunt, it's not edged. You could kind of go for edge, but edged kind of means that um, you you could get like a severed, severed, like your arm gets chopped off or something like that, right? Okay, we're gonna go with this. You can get concussed. You can get cussed with a blunt, with a blunt injury. Your skull can get crushed with a blunt, uh, with a blunt injury. And I can actually go for similar, um, similar things here. I'm not just looking then at, um, at, at um, heads. So your crushed skull is gonna equal death here. On an edged one, it can be decapitated. Piercing, it could be. Um, pierced skull and tooth and claw would be um, crushed skulls like an animal has crushed your skull um, right we're gonna start from the we're gonna start from the worst and go down I think I'm gonna go narrative. I, I've said before the narrative will be down to the players initially, but um, I might end up adding narrative flavor to these um, later, much later on, maybe even after a Kickstarter. Um, go home here, do a search for FBL. And critical injuries. So what have we got? We've got slash wounds, blunt, and stab. Stab is piercing, so basically the same thing, right? Slash and edged. Um, yeah. Let's look at what they got here. So blunt force. We've got stunned, which is a concussion, which I'm kind of happy with. I don't want stunned or breathless. They seem a little bit um, not good enough. Broken nose, I guess, isn't so bad. Let's have a look at the, the really horrible ones. Crushed skull is one. Broken, oh, but fuck, yeah, broken neck is a good one. We got a broken neck. 
I hope crushed ribs are in there, broken ribs. Broken ribs are in there. Okay, we'll put those somewhere on there. Crushed knee, crushed elbow, crushed foot. Um, okay, so I, th we, I had this big discussion with somebody before about... Um, well, not, I didn't have the discussion. This is a discussion on a server, um, the Mud and Blood server, I believe is where it was, about um, hit locations. And how in, if you think about how a fight would tends to happen, people are trying to, like all of your vital organs are in the center, your center mass. Your head is really important. People are trying to protect their, their body and their head from being attacked. So most injuries that are being afflicted are being afflicted on your arms because you're use, getting your arms up to like get most of the, uh, take the brunt of the attack. Um, or also potentially your legs as well as people are trying to trip you or like, you know, if your arms are in the way or you've got a shield, they're going for your legs. So really, arms and legs should be more, feature more on, on these, I think. Um, oh yeah, leave narrative to you. Absolutely. So, we're going to go with, um, on a high result, the idea is it's a lucky hit. So the lower results are going to be things like, um, things happening to your... Um, to your arms and your legs, the things that are more likely to be happening. Um, or maybe that's the ones with the higher probabilities, actually. So we're going to say, um, like, the the middle one is going to be a broken arm. Which is pretty pretty severe, right? You don't want a broken arm. Um, worse than that, because you can't get away, is a broken leg, I would suggest. Which is what they've got here. We've got two in between. We've got a crushed foot and a crushed elbow. Um, crushed, I guess, means that it's permanent, right? If you got a crushed knee, fuck, a crushed knee is pretty, pretty nasty. So we're gonna go with a crushed knee. Because you won't be able to, you won't be able to walk again. <laughs> or you're not gonna be walking very easily. And a crushed elbow. I'm gonna say crushed arm. That feels pretty, pretty nasty to me. Uh, broken ribs, then, are gonna be... Get a single broken rib. Groin hit. Gotta have the groin. You gotta have the groin hits in uh in a Wolfrook based game. Although the groin hit is a little bit more I'll take that out, actually. Knocked out teeth I like that. Um Smash teeth. Broken fingers. Broken nose. Concussion. There we go. Look at that. Yeah, what well, kind of what I was just talking about as well. Um, so rather than putting a sentence in here like you've got with uh, the Warhammer one, I believe. Yeah, I agree. Okay, that works. Let's look at edged. Slash wounds. Got the concussion. Get rid of that. So decapitation was already there. Decapitation, not decapitated. This is how we're doing this. Um, cleft skull, we're gonna leave. Slit throat. That's fucking nasty as hell. Severed leg. Okay, I like these. Your leg gets chopped off. Uh, your arm gets chopped off, which is the equivalent of the crushed arm. Ruptured intestines. Um, bleeding gut. I like that one. Punctured lung is pretty fucking terrible as well. Especially in the medieval ages. You might get back from that one. Um, in fact, that's probably worse than... Ah, is it worse than bleeding guts? They're both lethal, I think. No, you got two lungs, don't you? <laughs> Severed foot where your foot gets chopped off. Yeah. Um...
No, the idea with the two is that it's not worse, it's it's good. So you're rolling a critical injury, the lower you roll, the better off you are, right? So the idea being I mean I I could do I could look at probabilities that way, but the idea is that you're getting a, a fairly serious injury and if you roll if you roll well, if you roll like snake eyes, two ones on it, you've rolled like just like with the the D sixty six table if you roll if you roll an eleven which theoretically is two ones, which is also the probability is quite low, really. Um, the idea is you get away kind of with a fairly minor injury. And I'm with the same thing here. So you get, if you roll, if you do roll low enough, then the injury isn't too bad. But the likelihood is it's going to be something fairly serious. Um, but you could, I could do it so that the minor ones are the, the minor ones are the ones in the center of the, of the bell curve and the, and the probability curve around like six, seven, eight, and the more extreme ones are on tail ends, but I want to kind of, I want to do it this way. I want the injuries to be, uh, by doing it this way, I'm making it so that the injuries are a bit more, are more likely to be more severe. Um, you don't want to get injuries, right? The idea is if you get an injury, you're probably going to get fucked up unless you get really lucky with your dice roll. Um, and I like that. I like, I want that to be the case. I want characters to get fucked up pretty quickly. Um, still, like, instant death is going to be fairly hard to roll. Like, you've got a 2% chance of rolling an instant death because it's a, it, you have to roll two sixes on your dice. Okay. And for people who've played Wolfrup, that, that's actually absolutely what they want as well. They want um, really deadly wounds. Like, every time you're rolling a critical, you're like, shit, this is happening. The problem with this is that it's going to be happening fairly frequently in, in Pitchfork. But it is what it is. All right. Punctured lung, slashed eye, severed ear, wounded shoulder. Um, hmm. We're gonna go with the worst. the The easiest way you can get off is you get your finger chopped off. Then you're gonna get a bleeding, slashed. Thigh. Slashed mouth. Fucking hell. That would be that would be a horrible thing to have happen. Cut in the face with a sword and having your mouth sliced open. Um, what do they call that? A Glasgow... Is it called like a Glasgow smile or something like that? I'm not going to look it up. Because there will be some horrible pictures coming up on um, Google probably. Oh yeah, let me zoom in a bit. Et voila. I do usually try and uh, zoom in anyway. All right, Magnus, thanks for chatting. Catch you later. All right, slash thigh, severed finger. I think a slashed, if you get a, a slashed thigh, that's not too bad. I think losing a finger is a bit more severe than that. Um, severed finger. I like, I mean, slashed mouth is pretty horrible. I'm going to put that in there. Severed tendon. I like the, actually, the severed ear I like as well. The ear there. Get your ear chopped off. Do I have an ear here as well? Nope. I feel like this, I think like the punctured lung is as the default is a little bit too extreme. What's the seven here? Broken arm. It's nowhere near the same levels of broken arm. In fact, all of these are a little bit. Nine, 10, 11 are all bad news right 12 always always death 9 10 and 11 is like useless permanent thing 8 is a broken leg that'll heal bleeding guts isn't lethal it'll heal um, I think a wounded shoulder um, slashed shoulder is probably roughly equivalent to 
Yeah, pierced torso. Oh, I got piercing. Piercing is the next one, so I don't want to do pierced, right? Um, the edged one is specifically you're getting hit with an edged weapon. Like a, an axe. Think an axe, the side of a blade, of a side of a sword. Um, but piercing is arrows, point of a sword, that sort of thing. And that's where we're going to get the um, the kind of pierce, the more piercing damage type of thing. Next. Okay, so we got slash shoulder. Your shoulder gets slashed on a seven. Um, your ear gets chopped on a five. What happens in between? Um, <laughs> I'm gonna open the the Wolfrip one because that had a lot of that has a lot of flavor in it. Uh, recent. Oh, FBL. I'm looking at all. Like the search results. Close. There we go. Here we go. So one bladed weapons. Just general bladed weapons one. Oh, that's way too wordy. I'm gonna open the actual wolf rope. Wolfrop, um, let's go with the second edition of Wolfrop, I think. Core rule book. Not very good. Hmm. I don't have Kingdom Death Monster because it's super expensive. <laughs> and I don't really play board games. I'm aware of what it is though. Um, unless they've got like their rules as a free PDF or something, which some board games do. Hamstrung's a good one. Hamstrung's a good one. Is that better or worse than a slash shoulder? <laughs> it's worse. Um, I need something that's not... That's in between getting your ear chopped off, which really isn't lethal... And getting your shoulder like slashed, so your your arm is going to be a little bit useless for a bit. What's the we have for the um, seven was a broken arm, broken rib was on six. So like, what's the equivalent of getting like a broken rib um, from an edged weapon? That could be. I mean, we're talking punctured young lung from a, a slash wound, but then we got stab wounds, which also have a punctured lung. I'm not really. I don't really want, like punctured lung is a good one, I think, for pierced. Um, yeah, but bleeding gash is like where's that? That's kind of a low one. I mean, I can just move these all up a little bit. Oh, you mean like it's bleeding heavily? So it could say um, yeah, no, I actually like that. So the bleeding is the bleeding is the bad thing. Okay, I like that bleeding gash. Ah, uh, it's an archery though, isn't it? No, I think I want something else. It's a little bit too generic. So, slash shoulder is the one with um, being able to lift weapon. So, I think maybe hamstrung is the one where you can't really run. So, that equates to, if you look at a 7 and 8 here, 7 is a broken arm and 8 is a broken leg. 6 is a broken rib, which is like your pain because your ribs. So, and we can say slashed ribs. So you could get you, your, your ribs could be slashed. You get a slash across your ribs. That's pretty painful. So, do that.
Okay, we move on to piercing. I mean, there's a lot of similarities here, I guess. Um, in fact, you could I could almost you could almost make some <laughs> could almost make this even easier and say uh, what are the similarities that have come up here? We've got a we've got a face injury. We have a hand injury. We have a... Let's say head injury, hand injury, face injury. Torso injury. Arm injury, leg injury. Um, arm loss, leg loss, nearly lethal, lethal, or we could say instant death. Wild card. Okay, so if we take these, we we'll use that as a template. So we're kind of looking at similar things. So. If you've got a piercing, something pierce, something piercing attacks you and it hits you in the head. Pierced ear. I mean, what's the, uh, I'm not a big fan of that. Um, pierced cheek is kind of cool. Yeah. Hand run through, face injury again, we've got um, pierced eye, you're going to lose an eye. Old card. We've got knocked out teeth up here, smashed teeth. And then we had a slashed mouth. Pierced eye. Broken teeth. Pierced hip. Pierced leg. <laughs> Just everything's called pierce this, pierce that, pierce this. Uh, so we've got a severed leg artery. Severed arm artery. Impaled neck. <sighs> For some reason, I thought the Forbidden Lands ones were um, long descriptions as well, rather than just uh, what we've got. That's cool, though. Punctured groin. Yeah. That torso injury. Skewered groin in Forbidden Lands, like that. Arm injury. Pierced leg, pierced arm. I mean, yeah, you get a, you get like a, you get like an arrow where you get stabbed in the arm. That should be the most common one, because your arms are waving around. Okay, tooth and claw. Tooth 
torn torn ear hand injury lost finger face injury Um, slashed face. Come back to the wild card. Yeah. Torso injury, we're going to go with, um, so if an animal's attacking and gets to your injury, it's going to be um, torn bleeding chest. Arm injury is going to be um, ripped, ripped up arm. up leg arm torn off leg torn off right this one has animals in it I believe so I'm gonna go look at those up very quickly tooth and claw there we go For a body one, I think. You rip flesh from your opponent's side and hip, fracturing his pelvis. He's knocked to the ground helpless for this many turns. Oh, belly. Oh my god, a belly. <laughs> Getting an animal ripping into your belly is pretty much nearly lethal. Um, eviscerated. Visceration. And we're going to do that as the death one. Because you're going to die if you get eviscerated, aren't you? Um, is evisceration also when... Um, or also is it when your guts spill out? Disembowelment. Okay. Yeah. Might even use that term instead. Disembowelment. No, evisceration I like. Alright, what else have we got? Um, Eyes mangled. So you're blinded. Where was where did I have blinded before? I don't think I had any blinded one. So we could do for blunt, we could do like a gouged eye. Smashed teeth, broken rib, broken arm, broken leg, crushed arm, crushed knee, broken neck. Those are all good. Broken fingers is good. Broken nose. I think we're going to move this broken nose up to concussion, and we're going to say gouged, gouged eye. Uh, piercing, we need some something to get shot in the eye. Pierced eye, I've got it already. Awesome. Okay. And then we've got tooth and claw. Tooth and claw. 
Um, I wanted a blinded option. Eyes mangled. Um, right, I need a wild card one. I need something that's not too deadly, but also not too light for tooth and claws, so like a, a wild animal. In between getting your face slashed, which is going to affect your fellowship a little bit, and having your chest kind of torn at, like, bleeding. In fact, bleeding chest should be a little bit down, because it's not that bad. Um, so between having your chest kind of ripped open and being bleeding, and your arm getting kind of ripped ripped up. Um, it's not ripped up. It's the equivalent of a broken arm, so it's kind of a little bit useless. What's the next thing that I could put there? Um, that's what I'm trying to think about. I think a body shot would be good. That isn't too bad. You got a bleeding chest. That, that, a bleeding chest assumes that you're, like you're, they've managed to like bite or scr like. scratch you with claws so that you're like ripped open a little bit but you're like if your ribs your ribs probably would have protected you right so maybe one up from that could be um your ribs are fucked somehow what else have we got maybe something to do with your head We've already got a slashed face. I don't want that another face thing. I think we've got enough here with legs and stuff. So I think I'm going to go with um, the ribs. So I do the ribs. What did I do with ribs before? Six. Which is where I'm at. Six was a broken rib. So we're going to go here with... Um, smashed. Smashed rib. Smashed ribs. We're gonna make it plural. Same here. We we'll go with broken ribs. All right. And just like that, I've got some, I've got some uh, results here that are not too far off from each other. But I, I quite like this. I quite like this approach. Um, where I have eleven different results for. You don't have to roll for a hit location, which I quite like. So I don't need to. I don't need to go down that route. Um, they get worse depending on how your 2d6 roll goes, and I think that I think that works quite well. All right, so what's the effect? I'm over time now. Um, so. Plus difficulty. Alright, I'll have to do this in, um, in Word, I think. Uh, Google Docs, I mean. So, we're going to have injury tables. We're going to go with 2d6 instead of d66. So, that's some of my design goals. Ascending order of severity, done that. No temporary stuns, they're all injuries, done that. One instant death entry, done that. Only one injury table. No, I haven't done that, but I'm kind of I'm kind of okay with that. So alright, sign goals are more or less achieved. Alright. So this is gonna be blunt injuries. Blunt force. Blunt force injuries. We've got 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Alright, I'm going to delete the rest. And I'm going to copy and paste this table a few more times. Delete rows. Injury tables. Next one we've got is um, 
bladed injuries. We got piercing injuries. And then we've got tooth and claw injuries. All right. All right, all right. In fact, this one can go on the next page. Insert. Page break. All right. So. I probably. Just want to distribute those. So this is all going to be EV Garamond in size 11 and like so. Gouged eye, not gauged eye. Bladed weapons. Okay, get the last one in, tooth and claw. Okay, there I've got my entry tables in. Blunt force, bladed, piercing, and tooth and claw. Um, I'll have to figure out what the effects are, but it's um, basically instant death. Is going to be a feature of the number 12 result for all of these. One thing I need to do now is I need to change Add one to your result. For 
every we're already suffering add plus one to your result per Per injury you already have. Okay. I have a feeling this is going to be too deadly, but um, I think that'll be okay. Broken neck. What does a broken neck mean here? Paralyzed from the neck down. Permanent. Crush knee. Like unusable. Roll d6, odd equals left leg, permanently unusable. I think I'm gonna stop now. I'm starting to starting to wane a little bit. Um, what I want is to have some sort of mechanical effect here too. So arm permanently unusable. Um, minus one, two, physique. Minus one, agility. Broken leg. It's kind of more than minus one. It's minus two, maybe. Think about this. Yeah, I tend to agree, actually. I think it was maybe a little bit more important when it's... Um, a flat roll but when it's on a bell curve like this I kind of like that it's you it's pretty severe already when it's kind of in the middle here um, so I think I think I, I think you're right there so I'm gonna leave it in there in case I want to add it later but I'm gonna cross I'm gonna do this um, is it um, alt shift 5 yeah When you fail your trauma roll, or discuss that, let's take that out. So we're going to say roll 2d6 and consult the relevant. I uh, want one other type of table I could add in here. There's a few more that are just kind of cropping into my head. The types of creatures that will be attacking you. Um, so I'm kind of covered the physical attacks. Blunt force, bladed, piercing. Tooth and claw are for like wild animals or monsters. But what about supernatural creatures like ghosts or... Um, I mean, you could make an argument for like demons. They either wet their eye or something like that could kind of count under tooth and claw. Um... But like mystical damage. We'll see. Pitchfork armor hack. I have armor in here. Look at that. 
got like a half a page all about armor. Yeah, mental trauma, I guess. Makes sense. Okay. So, we're saying no effects. I mean, what I could do here is I could just... I could summarize this into fewer tables. Okay. Let's do that. One page then. Shit, I could probably almost get it into... Oh, yeah. All right. The severed, the three word ones are going to be a bit tricky. Hand run through. Pierced hand. Every time I say the word pierced, I think of community. Chevy Chase's character. Severed arm archery. this over to the edge, which is what I wanted. Paint over even a little bit more. Paint this one over here. Look at that. Oh yeah, okay, now we're talking. Everything in one table. Alright. That's a good way to end it. So, Injury tables, blunt force, bladed, piercing, tooth and claw. Let me just make those center justified so it looks a little bit nicer. But also get rid of, whoops, get rid of the uh, indentation. Yeah, that'll do, that'll do. Yep, 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 yep. Cool. You gotta come up with torments. Um, I might do a similar D66 table. I mean, a 2D6, I meant, not D66. Yeah, it's gonna fit it all on one page then. Distribute rows, sorry, delete rows. All right. I can probably do this one quickly as well, based off the Vazen ones, because I like the Vazen ones a lot. Um, kind of cherry pick the best ones from here, I think. It's 
probably the way to do it. So. Claustrophobic. So the idea here is I'm, I want to go with um, I want to go with the defects more than the actual injuries here, right? I mean I could kind of do both, but this is the idea is I want these to be. Um, I don't like to use the term insanity, but the idea is that they're like disorders almost, um, but also more like the effect that is the effect that you have, the symptoms rather than the actual. Um, the actual defect, or the, or not the defect's the wrong word, the actual disorder. So claustrophobic, it's a phobia, it's a symptom, um, what's a type of phobia? What's we got here? Shattered confidence is another good one. Paralyzed by doubt. Hear voices. Overly sentimental is an interesting one. Um, High strung. Capricious. Lack of trust. Paranoid. Lack of trust and paranoid are kind of similar. I'm going to go with paranoid. Oh, paranoid seems a little bit more extreme, though. Maybe. Self-loathing is a good one. Nightmares. Self-loathing is a hard one, actually. I'm going to get rid of that one. Because um, that might not make a lot of sense a lot of the time. It is good. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yep, 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 yep. I hear you, Eric. I hear you. Let's have a look here. Horror injuries. Let's look at Forbidden Lands instead of Vazen for a second. Nightmares, nocturnal, phobic. In fact, I think phobic is probably a good one. Phobia. I could even do a phobia table, D12 phobia table, um, but I won't. I've done that before, actually. What did I do that for? Nord Saga, I think. Yeah. Paranoia is quite high. Heart attack. Ah, heart attack is a good one. Yeah, there's an instant death option here. Catatonic. It was haunted on here. I'm sure haunted was on here. So claustrophobia, a phobic is on here, but so is claustrophobic. I'm gonna leave it. Um, I guess nightmares are pretty. Nightmares aren't that extreme, in the grand scheme of things, right? Um, shattered confidence, anxious is exactly the same. Well, it's more or less the same. Paralyzed by doubt.
<sighs> Drunkard. Drunkenness. Two edge. Alcoholism. I kind of like high strung being on there. Um, I'm gonna open up, I'm gonna fire up um, Nord Saga, because I had, had through a lot of these things, and I like quite a lot of them. Uh, Nord Saga. Oop, I need to do uh, docs.google.com. I need to hide this because I'm working on a secret project and I can't show what it's called yet. <laughs> So I'm working on my other screen for a sec. Nord Saga. Let's find Nord Saga. Uh, which version? I've got so many drafts. Been working on this thing since 2017 or 2016. Hmm. Not that one. And maybe this one. So I can do a search, can't I? Nord Saga Phobia. Phobias and manias. Um, oops. So mythomania, you can't stop yourself from lying, which is a pseudomania. Quite a slightly different emphasis on certain different elements of lying. Um, egomania, self-worship. <sighs> Obsessed with... So pyromania is a great one, like you have to set things on fire. Um, Legiromania, kleptomania, those are all good ones. You gotta steal things. Hydromania, you're obsessed with water. I mean, they're all co very contextual, right? It's kind of hard to just pick one. <sighs> Alright, I've got paranoia anyway. Let's look at Forbidden Lands again. Uh, 
Delusions. Hallucinations. Amnesia. Amnesia's a good one. Oh yeah. Hallucinations. Paranoia is going to be the main one. You're paranoid. I think that's fine. Go with illusion. I like that. That works. Yeah, Messiah Complex is, is a cool one. I mean, there's so many different things you could do here. Um, and indeed, like, the whole idea behind this is it's a little bit OSR-ish. I'm taking some inspiration from the OSR. I kind of expect people to... Um, to kind of hack this a little bit. So, I don't really want to necessarily do everything. Now, one thing I could do here, in fact, I'll do this, is I'll do... Um, I'll insert a column to the right, and then I'll insert another column to the right. And what I could do here is I could do phobias. And I could do manias. So you have like a fear of heights, you could have a fear of the claustrophobia. Did I put claustrophobia in there already? No. So acrophobia, claustrophobia. Hemophobia, yeah, hemophobia. Fear of blood. Oh, hafo. Fear of touch. These are all good ones to roleplay a little bit, I think. So, this is a fear of heights. This is a fear of confined space. Says. Um, hafo. Afraid to sleep, that's another good one to roleplay. Hypnophobia. Monophobia. Don't leave me alone. Necrophobia, fear of dead things, that's good. Fear of fire. Necro, dead things, or just death, I guess we could just make it shorter. Pyro, sphere of fire, pyrophobia. <laughs> fear of darkness, amazing. Scotto. Xeno, xenophobia. It's closely tied to racism in a lot of people's heads. Um, by the way, that zoophobia, fear of animals. Uh, what else can I put in here? Narrow places. Fear of birds, fear of teeth. Fear of dirt, not easy in a village, in a rural village. I mean, thunder could be good. Is there like a loud noises one? Is there a loud noises one? There was a phobia for, or a mania for loud noises. 
Legiro. So they're probably the opposite of this. Let's look up Legirophobia and see if that's a fear of loud noises. Fear of loud noises. Phonophobia. Phonophobia. We're going to go phonophobia. Oh boy, it's getting quite big. Oh, I can make this bigger actually, I think. Torment's a bit smaller, and I can make this a bit bigger. Here we go. Alright, one more. One more, and then I'm done with the phobias at least. <laughs> um. Good night. Yeah, I'm 40 minutes over. Apologies. Fear of those manias. Fear of falling. Have I got that already? That's a good one. Fear of crowds is a good one. It's the flip side of... Um, Monophobia. Demophobia. Crowds. Alright, let's look at the manias. Let's see if I can do this fairly quickly and we'll stop for tonight. Obsessed with sharp objects. That's a good one. Eichmophobia. Eichmomania. Sharp objects. Obsessed with pain. It's kind of sick, but we're going to go with that one. Obsessed with cheerfulness. Obsessed with spending. Solitude. Auto. Hmm. Obsessed with one's beauty. Obsessed with cold things. Obsessed with staying in bed. Ex obsessed with with experiencing fear. Countermania. Obsessed with killing. Nope. Don't need to encourage murder hoboism. Dermatillomania. Picking at your skin. <sighs> yeah, that's a good one. Sounds like a horrible thing to... To do. To have as a... An obsession. Dermatillomania. Obsessed with wandering. That's good. You're con constantly wandering off. I like that. Ecdemio. Ecdemiomania. Wandering. Egomania. Self worship. Obsessed with being still. Need to laugh. Could be a kind of a funny one. Forced laughter. Just put laughter. Holy shit, I've got a big list here. Are these just manias? Corrected list of manias. Fucking hell. T 
totes. Obsessed with hands is kind of interesting one. Yeah, we are. There's a lot of manias, aren't there? Chiromania. Add that one in. I'm going to remove that one just because I don't like that it's on two lines. The fear of being touched. That's a great one. Chiraptomania. Chirapto. Chirapto. It's not the fear of being touched. It's the obsession of being touched. Of touching. Wait, are you obsessed with being touched or touching others? I think I might skip that one. Time is a good one. Chronomania. Obsessed with time. Something's happened. Can't stop. You always got to be moving. Chrono. Chronomania, obsessed with time. That's a good one. Food. Sex. Feces. Clowns. The internet. Cybermania. Okay. Prostitutes. Vener venereal diseases. Ghosts. Dining. Decals. Insanity. People. Obsessed with people. Is that what I've got already? Didn't, no, that, that was crowds I put down. Oh, fear of crowds. Right, different mate. Obsessed with crowd. Obsessed with people. Um, where was that mania where you're picking at your skin? What was that called? Dermatillo. It's not on here. Interesting. <clears throat> Obsessed with praise. Opinions or praise. Doxomania. Look that one up. Feels a little bit weird to be looking this stuff up. To be fair, um, considering that some people probably really suffer from these. I'm still going. Right, I'm gonna put this website down. I'm gonna I'm gonna finish up because this is get probably quite boring to watch. I'm gonna put just under here the link. I'll come back to it. And I'm just gonna put some quick words in here about torments. Um When suffering from a torment, when suffering a torment, nope, when a torment is inflicted, roll 2d6 and consult. Relevant on the injury table in Appendix B. Can 
control K, headings, scroll to the bottom. Entry tables. Consult the torment column from the torment table in Appendix C. If a phobia, fear of something, or mania, obsession with something, it might make sense from the context. If it makes sense in the context of what caused the torment. Choose a phobia or mania instead. You may choose a phobia or mania instead. <clears throat> okay, so the idea here is that, if it's not clear what I, what I mean by that, is that you roll for a torment or you pick a phobia or a mania. Um, so the idea is like if you're picking one out, then you're able to tie it directly into what just happened. So the the narrative of, of what caused you to either become obsessed with something or to become afraid of something. And that's why I want to keep them quite separate. It's like I don't want to just have a phobia of one thing and a mania of the other because you're not rolling randomly to, um, to choose one. Um, you're actually picking one out. In fact, what I'll probably do is I'll probably stick a column in here. Not just a narrow, narrow column like that. Um, ah, fucked everything up here. Something like this. There we go. And this column is going to be no background, no border. Oh, fucking hell. I can only do it one by one, huh? It's really annoying. Oh, I can do it like this, too. Okay. Okay, you can only do that one. Wait, what? like this like point. here we go all right there got a little separation here going on where I've I've split them off just to make it a little bit clearer that these aren't rolled necessarily rolled for um, but yeah so that's me done for tonight um i've got my injury tables thank you ibram for the suggestion to do t 2d6 um i quite like that i quite like the results here as well um i need to add a little comment in here for injuries the effect injuries should be recorded in the Oh, 
on your character sheets and the effects should be um, provided by the GM. I know, um, I know, Eric, you've said that you're happy to come up with it yourself, but not everybody will be. Not every GM will be. So I'm thinking I'm probably going to provide some sort of guidance on on how to try and come up with that. Holy moly, what happened there? There we go. Injuries should be recorded on your character sheet, and the effects should be um, in effects. Would be provided by the GM. Most injuries remain on your sheet until they are completely healed. Most of the time, this will simply mean a increased difficulty in related tests. I think we just leave it as simple as that. Most of the time, this will simply mean increased difficulty in related tests. So, you have a broken leg. You want to roll agility. It's either going to be two successes or three successes required, depending on exactly what you're trying to do. It's as simple as that, right? Um, yeah. Cool. Record your injuries on your character sheet. The effects of your injuries will be uh, the effects of your injury. Oh, okay, how do I write this? Record your injuries on your character sheets. On your character sheets. Injury effects most often result in increased difficulty for related tests. The GM GM can expand on this as needed. Record your injuries on your character sheet. Injury effects most often will most often result in increased difficulty for related tests. Injuries will most often When testing ah, I'm gonna highlight this <laughs> I'm tired I'm tired of struggling now just wanted to get that out of my head uh, about the effects um, torments torments are permanent Most torments are permanent, though some more mild ones um, in a medieval society, most tor most torments will be permanent. In, med in medieval
Most torments will be permanent, though um, the GM can remove... The GM can um, have them fade with time or even be reversed or even be cured um, if the story demands it. If the story, if the story so, if this serves the nerd, oh my god! <laughs> I can tell when I'm getting tired because the words just turn into uh, it just turns into word salad. You have them fade with time, or even be cured. If this serves the narrative. All right, that'll do for now. All right done thanks for watching <laughs> i'm gonna end the stream now so uh yeah <sighs> thanks everyone for um for staying on chatting with me for so long and uh for the the good tips that was really helpful um i would have probably gone a very different direction a much longer winded direction very very full lots of text injury tables uh, but I quite like this this kind of lighter approach. I like the fact that there's a bell curve on them as well. So the likelihood of rolling... It's still the same... If you think about it, if you have a D66 table and the 66 entry is instant death, while it's a flat probability curve of where you when you would roll a 66, you still need two sixes on the dice. And it's still the same likelihood as it is here with the 2D6 table. Um, it's just that the results are clumped more around the middle. You're more likely to be rolling um, this kind of like pierced arms, broken arms, ripped up arms than you would in the other system because the other system, the results would be just all over the place, right? Um, yeah, I quite like this. So at least for playtesting to see um, initially to see how it, how it kind of pans out, I'm quite quite interested to see how this, how this um, what happens. Uh, manias, I'm also, the phobias and manias, fitting them in there, I think is also kind of interesting. Um, that's one thing I liked about Forbidden Lands when I, when I came up with that. Whoa. So what I came up with when I borrowed the idea of phobia mania tables from Call of Cthulhu, I quite like that as well, where it's looking at, um, you know, when you, when your insanities kick in, something... Your, your mind kind of latches onto something and it's either afraid of that thing or becomes obsessed with that thing. And I really like that. Um, what I could do, in fact, is I could look at the torments and I could change the torment slightly and say one of the torment results is a phobia. One of the phobia results is a mania. So if you roll high or low enough, um, so basically you have to roll the second time. You've landed on a phobia. You've landed on a mania. You don't actually roll a second time. You pick one. So it's like, okay... Um, this one makes the most sense in this situation is that I've got hypnophobia. I'm afraid of um, sleeping. Something like that. So that might be a better way to f of handling it is to add those in. Um, something like high strung. We can take high strung out. Um, and delusion. Because manias are kind of delusions. Paranoia is a good one, but I'm going to move that up, I think, to eight. So six and seven. I think six is going to be a phobia. No. Paranoia is going to be six. You're paranoid about something. You've got paranoia. Seven is going to be a phobia. Phobia, and I'm going to say choose. Ah, it won't fit. Typical. Fucking typical. Move over. Yeah. Choose. Damn it. Phobia asterisk. Let's try that. Mania. Asterisk asterisk. Phobia. Choose one. Manias. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know. Manias, choose one. There we go. That works. So got this. You roll phobia. There's an asterisk. You look over to the side. Phobias. It says choose one. You're not rolling. That should be self-explanatory. Shouldn't need to put anything else on there. 
Um, but I can take out. Um, I can just tidy up where it's where it's talking about it under conflict, under torment, and say. Um, If you roll for a phobia or mania, choose choose one that fits the narrative rather than rolling a second time for one. Choose one of the options that fits the narrative rather than rolling a second time for one. Okay, I kind of like that. So looking back at it again, um, the torment tables, we've got paranoia, we've got phobia at number seven, mania at number eight. So those are um, relatively frequent results. I'm happy with that. Let me put some more manias in. A bit later. Cool. Yeah. So, yeah. Once again, thanks everyone for um, for watching and um, yeah, contributing. It was uh, really helpful. And uh, yeah, if you got any questions or comments, leave them in the description or the comments below. Um, hit the subscribe and like button if you haven't already. That really helps the channel. Um, helps me grow. Is it helps the channel to grow? Um, and helps me see what's resonating with people as well. So. But I'm assuming if you're already this far along and you're watching episode 14, you have probably watched the previous um, dev, dev Diaries and you're already a fan. You've already subscribed, etc. So, um, yeah. Thanks very much for watching and I'll catch you next time. Bye-bye.